I am going to start recording. Okay, we are recording now. Okay. So anyway, so if you if you do want to buy any of uh, any of his books or any other books, we we do ship everywhere. Uh, we have a huge load of books, and we can get almost any books that you want. Um, and um, we you know we do order by phone, and we do uh, if you send us email, um, we can get whatever you want. We do mail order for uh, have Bill's books here. Okay. Anyways, thank you, Bill. I'm going to mute myself me, now. Okay. Let me introduce you. Um, okay. Okay. And uh, Cassandra, if anybody else wants to enter, just let them in. Okay. Okay. All right. So let me introduce uh, J. William Zoldak. Uh, or Bill Zoldak, um, and uh, who I guess you all know him so far. Um, so uh, since you all know him, I'm not going to give him a big introduction. Um, but uh, this is his latest book. He has written other books, um, but this is his latest book that he wrote really as uh, letters to his grandchildren. Um, Grandpa's Dear Story. Uh, okay, so are you ready to start, Bill? I am. And so uh, let me just begin by uh, thanking uh, Annie's Bookstore for hosting this. Um, and if I want I want to get into the story pretty quickly, but I, I asked uh, Selena to put this photograph up. in the background that is the uh, field in which the this takes place and just to sort of back up a little bit and tell you a little bit about me uh, these are letters these books reading and I'm hoping there's going to be several more are letters to my grandchildren uh, because I wanted them to kind of know about things in the 1950s when I was growing up and so these are all true stories about things that I've done or have happened to me. And some of them are adventures and, and some of them are, um, well, some of them are about animals and that kind of thing. But to just to make it, to end up with this, the this is what you would see if you looked out my back window when I was a little boy of maybe anywhere from eight to 15 years old. And that's what, that was my playground uh, every day. So uh, this story is about, is about a deer. And uh, if you could go to the next slide, Selena. <clears throat> and that's the same big field uh, where the story takes place. And I ha had this photo put in because it shows the stone wall. And the stone wall will be a part of the story. Now, I will tell you that this photograph and the other one were taken about a year ago. And uh, so, as you might imagine, a stone wall has changed quite a lot in 50 or 60 years. And that, that will be the same rocks, but the wall would have been a little higher then. Uh, so let's get into the story. Uh, okay, and I just want to make sure that I announce before the end that the illustrator for this is Misty Fosano Hobbs. And she also illustrated my first book and she's a uh, close friend who was in Kansas City, um, possibly uh, a little bit later, I'm not sure. Um, okay, so let me begin. And if you go to, there we go. This one is, the, I'll, I'll start the story and then I, I wanna say something about this uh, illustration before we leave it. Dear grandchildren, Today, I want to tell you a story about an experience I had a long time ago. With some it happened near my childhood home along the west side of the Hudson River in the town of Cornwall, New York, about 60 miles north of New York City. Just stop for a moment. This is a map that the illustrator did for me, and it shows the Hudson River from New York City up to Cornwall, where the story takes place and it's about six miles in that stretch of uh, uh, the river.
Okay, I think I lost everybody for a minute. Yes, you did. I'm sorry. No, not, not a problem. The internet went down, I guess. I'd like to say that I've been, for the last five days or more, participating in um, a global symposium with people in 11 time zones. And this happens, so we're just all, it's like part of the new reality. Part of what happens, right. Okay, well, again, back, I may repeat myself a little bit, but white tail are wonderful and fascinating animals that are today very common and almost tame in some areas. But when I was a boy, there were far fewer of them and they were quite wild. And we go to the next slide. There we are. The house I lived in at the time was located about a quarter mile off a main road in a very rural section of town surrounded by small family farms. Behind my house, separated by a stone wall, was a five acre pasture. In the center of this pasture was a very large ash tree, which you can see in, the, in this particular illustration. <clears throat> During the warm summer days, cows would often graze in this pasture and relax in the shade of this beautiful tree. Beyond the pasture was an alfalfa field, separated from the pasture, not only by another stone wall, but also a thick growth of small trees and brush that lined the edge of the field, and often referred to as a hedgerow. The alfalfa field had been hayed off in June, and since this story takes place in late summer, the alfalfa had grown back. Deer particularly like feeding in this field. Beyond the alfalfa field was a large wooded area containing a full spectrum of vegetation and wildlife, including a large herd of white-tailed deer. Often, just before dusk, deer would cautiously come out of the woods and graze on the alfalfa. Because the alfalfa field sloped toward my house and the hedgerow between the pasture and the field had some sparse places in it, I could see the deer from my house. One evening, as I was watching the deer from my backyard, I got to wondering how far I could sneak up on them before uh, scaring them off. The more I thought about it, the more interested I became until I finally decided to give it a try. Using the denser parts of the hedgerow to shield myself from the deer, I crossed the pasture without being detected. Then hiding behind the stone wall at the edge of the alfalfa field, I watched the deer as they ventured further and further out into the open. There were six deer grazing fairly close together near the back of the back part of the field. And as you can see, this is an illustration of the deer. <clears throat> as I watched them, I thought about something I learned from my, either my father or my grandfather. I don't remember which. If you stay downwind of the deer so that they could not pick up the, your scent and you were perfectly still, the deer would not be alarmed even if they could see you. Well, I decided to put this theory to the test. The evening was clear and comfortably mild with a slight breeze, which by luck was blowing toward me. The condition seemed right for this experiment. <clears throat> I love this uh, illustration particularly. Uh, you'll know in a minute what I'm talking about, but those birds, you see their mouths are open? They're chatty birds and they're part of the story. And of course the squirrel is also. As I surveyed the surroundings, 
I looked for potential obstacles to my plan, such as a chatty bird that might give me away. Crows and blue jays are particularly troublesome in this regard. Do you know what Shadowland is? Do you know what? Or a, or a small mammal, such as a squirrel, that might sound the alarm. Seeing no problems, I slowly crawled over the stone wall, moving only when the deer lowered their heads to graze, or when they were looking in a different direction. They seemed very gorging themselves on the alfalfa grass. On the other side of the wall, I slowly and cautiously stood up and waited to see if I had been detected. They stayed in place seemingly unalarmed. Waiting until they were calmly grazing, I slowly took a step forward, and again there was no noticeable alarm in their movement. So I again waited until they were preoccupied with the alfalfa and then took another step forward. I did this several more times until I was clearly out in the field where the deer could see me easily, easily see me. <clears throat> to my surprise, there was no concern on their part at all. I took a few more steps to within perhaps 50 feet of the nearest deer. <clears throat> I was feeling pretty good about my success so far and would have been quite content if it had ended at this point, but it didn't. The sun was now, the sun now was close to the horizon and daylight was fading. I could see the, my shadow on the ground, which made me wonder if the deer would pick up on any movement in that, in that shadow. I didn't have much time, however, to ponder this thought because just then the deer that was closest to me seemed to become aware of my presence. She was a large, beautiful adult deer known as the doe. She had a big brown eyes, a brown coat, and a snowy white belly. Her ears were bent forward, trying to detect any sound. Her nose was in the air, sniffing the wind, and her tail twitched nervously. I had been discovered. Remaining perfectly still, I waited for her to make the next move. I didn't have long to wait. She began slowly and deliberately taking steps toward me, each one measured and with caution. As I remained statue-like, the other deer all stopped getting grazing and devoted their full attention to the drama that was unfolding before them. Step by step, she moved ever closer with all her body parts on full alert. After every step, every few steps, she would backtrack a little and then come forward again. Sometimes she would move to the left or to the right and then advance toward me, uh, me once more. When she was about 10 feet away, she stopped and looked straight at me as her tail, as she twitched her ears and sniffed the air trying to figure me out. I, on the other hand, was locked in place, breathing as little as possible. We remained like this for what seemed like an eternity, but was probably only a few moments. With her head lowered, ears forward, nose sniffing, and eyes fixed on me, she moved ever closer until she was only a couple feet away. By then I was holding my breath, realizing that I was in one of those moments in life that only happens once. She took one more step, stretched her neck, and laid her cold, moist nose on the back of my hand, the hand at my side. The moment her nose touched my hand, she made a backward lunge and a loud snort. She then darted toward the woods as fast as she could run. The other deer who had been watching took off with her. Within an instant, the drama was over and I was standing in the field alone. Well, grandchildren, which of which all are there today, that's nice. I hope you, <clears throat> I have a, two thoughts I would hope you take away from this story. 
First, I want you to think about how brave this deer was to venture forward while knowing the danger was near her all the while. Remember that courage is not restricted to humans alone. The other thought that I want you to think about is that there will be cherished moments in your lives that you carry with you forever. Of these moments, I wish you many, and I wish you all many. Love, as always, Grandpa. And let me just say before we leave that one, can we go back, uh, uh, Selena, or is that hard? Oops. <laughs> okay, just, to, just this one was an illustration of me as an older grandfather and my memory of that particular field, which you may recognize as the same photograph you saw before. And it's sort of just as a memory uh, in, in that particular uh, illustration. Okay, and that's, that's the end. And before we I go into a discussion, if we could go to the next page, Selena. Okay. That's an actual photograph of a white-tailed deer which I'm sure many of you recognize, but some, some of you might not. Uh, and what I did, because I wanted this to be a sort of a learning experience in this book for people, uh, I put in what I called white tail flags. And I was just trying to get a little bit cute with that. They're really white, ta with white tail information, which I'd like to spend a couple minutes on and, and just share with you. Uh, some thoughts about white-tailed deer. So let me begin with the first sentence. White-tailed deer are graceful and timid animals that are widespread across America. White-tailed deer are found probably in almost every state in America. They, they, they range from the East Coast to the West Coast. They live in, al <clears throat> in almost any place where fields, meadows, or where there are fields, meadows, or woodlands. And that's kind of important because while they spend a lot of time in the woods or the, or the woodland, they often go out into fields or meadows and, and graze because of course they, you know, they eat grasses and things and that's their food supply. And then the next one says their diet is made up of grasses and other vegetation found in their environment. They do have, eat other things besides grasses, as you'll see in a couple of minutes. But, you know, they, they, that's the main thing that they eat, but they will eat any kind of plant. If it, some of you have in your backyard, you'll know that because they sometimes go and uh, gorge themselves on plants that are they're not supposed to. Uh, and in the wintertime, of course, they'll eat almost anything because of the snow and so on. They can't get at the grasses very easily. In the fall of the year, this is my granddaughter's favorite line. In the fall of the year, they browse the forest floor looking for acorns to munch on. Acorns are like candy to deer. That's the part she likes. And it's, it's kind of true. They, they crave these, uh, these acorns. And, and for some of you who might not know about browsing, browsing just means that they're going along with their noses and sniffing and trying to find something to eat on, on the floor. And they often will be drawn to the underneath the oak trees and they eat these acorns, which they really love. They spend their entire lives close to the place they are born. And that's quite true. They, they're born in one place and, and they have, they range probably no more than a few square miles away their whole lives. Sometimes they go further, perhaps, if the food supply is not close by. But for the most part, they stay in those, those places uh, where, where they're born. And I have often found uh, deer that I recognize because sometimes they, while they look all similar, sometimes they have distinguishing uh, markings that you can tell. And I've seen them, you know, year after year, the same deer in the same area. I remember one time when I was young, there was a deer, a doe deer in our area that had a white belly, but the white came up almost to halfway up her sides. And so she was quite unlike the other, the other deer. And I would notice her year after year for several years, knowing that she was, would stay in that area. 
adult deer, <coughs> I mean, adult male deer are called bucks. Buck deer have antlers that fall off in the late winter and grow back during the spring and summer. The antlers are covered with velvet at first, but lose their outer coating as they age. And they go through a cycle every year when they grow antlers. And every time they grow antlers, they obviously grow different ones. And as they age, often, although not necessarily, they, they become larger uh, with what we call points, which are the tips of the antlers. Adult female deer are called doe. Does give birth in the springtime to small spotted babies called fawns. The fawns lose their spots as they age towards adulthood. When I was a boy, I used to find uh, fawns out in the, often in the fields, but a lot of times in the woods as well, because what the doe or the mother deer will do is they will hide the, their offspring, these little fawns, and basically they tell them to stay put, and, and they do. They don't move. Even if a human comes up upon them, they won't move. And so it's very important if a person comes upon a fawn that they not go near them or not touch them because that will upset the mother uh, thoroughly. Even if she's not there, she'll know the person was there because she can smell uh, humans from a long way away. And up close, of course, she would get a, a real good whiff of them. <clears throat> Although deer can be seen any time of the day, they are most active at night and search for food when there is less activity in their surroundings. And deer are pretty much nocturnal, although not totally, of course, because they you see them during the day quite often. But they do, they're very active at night and they feed a lot at night. And they can go places that they can't go during the day because they are under the shadow of the, of the night. Just after dawn, they often bed down in a hiding place where they remain during the daylight hours. This doesn't always happen, but it does quite often, is that they have a, they'll have a place where they go and have a nap all during the day because they've been up all night eating. And they'll stay there. And what I've found is if you get close to that hiding place, they won't run because they, they, you can't see them most of the time. They're so camouflaged and they're in a very thick place most of the time. And so you don't have to worry, they don't have to worry about you. Uh, they know you know, what their hiding place is, and they know whether they can be seen or not. <clears throat> Dawn and dusk are the best times to catch a glimpse of, of them as they transition in their routine. And of course, what they're doing is they come out of the hiding places during the day and they're on the move at dusk, and in the morning, they're going back to the hiding places. So that they move during those times most, of the, most often. Throughout history, Numbers have fluctuated depending upon the environmental conditions, such as the number of predators, including humans, near where they live. Of course, you know that deer are hunted by humans, so they are very cautious about that. But there are other conditions too. There are conditions such as uh, a, a harsh winter. A harsh winter would would uh, would be very devastating to uh, deer population because they can't get enough food. And so uh, there, there are losses during the, the winter time. Uh, so there are other, like I said, other conditions that do affect how many there are in a particular area. The next one explains the title of this. The name white-tailed deer comes from the fact that they have a large white tail that stands straight up when they run, often referred to as a flag. Humans may see only those flags during sightings. I've been in the woods many times, and I don't know the deer are there until they're on the run. And when they're on the run, of course, you see those, those deer flags sticking straight up uh, as they go along. And then the last thing I wanted to mention was that there are other type of deer besides uh, white-tailed deer, although they probably are the most numerous. So it's called the mule deer, and that's probably the second largest species in America. And they're similar, but they're larger with bigger ears and no white tail. 
They're found mainly in the western states. And of course, they're called mule deer mainly because they have big ears. <laughs> uh, and, and that's a way of identifying them. But you see them in the eastern part of the United States. You only see them in the western part. So whereas you see white-tailed deer throughout the entire United States, you usually don't see mule deer uh, in the east, only in the west. So I hope that gives you a little understanding of deer, which was part of my reason for writing the book to my grandchildren, because I wanted them to know about these fascinating, these fascinating creatures. At this point, uh, I would be uh, interested in if there are any questions or some discussion, uh, I think that would be great. Okay, um, before we, we get into questions, I just wanted to let everybody else know who came in late that you can buy these books um, through us uh, at any book stop of Worcester. Um, you can either visit us at uh, 65 James Street in Worcester, um, or you can look on our webpage at www.anniesbooksworcester.com. You can order by phone, 508-796-5613. Uh, and uh, we, we, you can order uh, um, through email, at orders at anniesbooksworcester.com. And we do mail order and curbside delivery. Um, and uh, anyways, um, so anyway, it, it's, uh, it, it, it's great. And thank you, Bill, for, for doing this. This is wonderful. I think this story is, is just fabulous. So I'm going to stop sharing right now, and we can see everybody. <laughs> so oh, that was great. <laughs> OK. Mm -hmm. So any, any thoughts or questions or conversation starters or anything you didn't know about deer or something you want to know more or any of those things? <laughs> oh, that's good. Okay. You need to, okay. Somebody needs to be unmuted. Oh, okay. Do you need to be unmuted here? Uh, yeah. You need to be unmuted. I've been very chatty, but it, yeah, am I here? You're unmuted, yes. Okay. So we can hear you, Carolyn. In, in the meantime, so, okay, and I think that your granddaughters might be listening on your daughter. Uh, that's true. My, grand, my granddaughters, uh, my two granddaughters, and I think my three granddaughters and my grandson perhaps are. I'm not sure. Yeah, I think, and I, I think I might have a niece and nephew, but... Right. So I actually arranged to meet for dinner tonight with my original boss who grew up in Burlington, Vermont, uh, of, of Christie's, and he's, um, he's a bit more artsy than his brothers, both of whom played minor league Red Sox, but he grew up in a major hunting family. And, and, um, and he threw up as a seven-year-old boy, the first time he had um, hunt a deer. And yet I, as you know, last year participated in an actual fox hunt on horseback. And there is ceremony in that. I think, how do we, um, the stories of hunting the fox, the fox is, the foxes take over your London garden. That's another thing to say, right? Like Londoners do not like foxes in their gardens. But how does the next generation, how are they receiving this new information about the deer hunt, which, uh, yeah, I'm gonna connect well, you well, to. I, I just, uh, let me just say this, Carolyn, that, uh, I, I pretty much tried to stay away from hunting in, in any of my stories because they are, they're for children. And uh, I know you can't shield people from that, but uh, I like this, I wanted to tell this story because it was not a hunting story, because it was a story that, you know, any young boy or girl could have, you know, could have done uh, if they so desired. Like a little bit Bambi, and it's 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 uh, 
to me, it, it was a wonderful experience and it was long before I was hunting. And I think that this, it's, it's, uh, it, it just, to me, it kind of, for me, it brings the warmth of uh, an interaction with nature. And in this particular case, an interaction with, uh, with deer. I've written other stories, which some of them will co hopefully come out later, that involve other animals in this same, uh, that I met in the same place where I grew up. Uh, but uh, this one was why I wanted to get out first because I thought it was, uh, I thought it was a, a kind of a nice story. And uh, it was also happened to be my wife's favorite story. So that was a, a good reason to do it. In fact, if you notice in the book or when you get the book, I dedicate it to my wife. It just happens to be the, the publication date just happens to be her birthday. <laughs> and that, was, that was done purposely, uh, of course. Uh, so, but anyway, so yeah, any, any other, uh, any other questions or thoughts? Diana has a question. Okay. Well, not exactly a question. I just want to thank you for taking me back to my own adventures in the Massachusetts woods as a child trying to sneak up on the deer. And we also had a huge cow pasture behind our house. And if my brother and I could sneak out after dinner when my mother wasn't looking, my father would always wink and let us go. We'd go into that field, especially when the grass was higher, and we'd lie there and wait and wait and wait to see if the deer would show up. So thank you so much. <laughs> Yeah, so that's that's a great story in itself, you know. And you and I could easily picture a person doing that, hiding in the <laughs> grass, because you know they're going to come out every night, you know, because that's where they feed. Uh, and they, if you track them uh, as a person does, if they live in this environment, it, you you know pretty nearly every evening where they're going to be, uh, and. So it, it's 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 kind of a neat a neat place to uh, a nice uh, nice location to grow up in. For sure, Bill. Um, I loved your climax of this story, and especially when you said, "I knew this was a once in a lifetime." <laughs> Just so special, and I thought of you yesterday. We get deer here a lot, and they're eating all my hosta and flowers. <laughs> And yesterday morning, I went out to talk to them. I had to shush them away. There was a mother and two little fawn. The mother and the one fawn took off, but the other fawn came walking toward me <laughs> to the point where I got a little, oh, what's this deer going to do? But then he eventually took off too, but made me think of you and your story. It's wonderful. It's great. I know um, for me, uh, my uh, brother-in-law's family uh, lives in, um, they live in Canada. Did we just lose somebody? We just lost Bill. Somebody. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we just lost Bill. <laughs> Seriously. Oh, well. <laughs> people are 11 time zones. And it, 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 it happens, but we're all virtually connected. You know, it's cool. Like, it's not cool <laughs> that we're apart, but we're gonna, re, we're gonna keep the thread going. They'll get back. Yeah, they'll be back. We lost a major person from one of our Oxford papers yesterday. It was an author, but we're gonna make a new session. Yeah, he'll get back. And, and we have to keep the connections going, you know, um, in um in a virtually there he is well i i lost you there uh. yeah he's a hunter he's actually he's a fisherman in terms of storytelling just uh, yeah. so yeah uh yeah. I, just uh, responding to uh to nancy you hear me nancy yeah oh okay so I don't, I don't know if you were finished. You were telling us about they're, they're eating your hostas. That's, oh, man. They love it. Yeah, they do. They love hostas. <laughs> I think you, you've, you've, you've shown something that uh, I wanted to point out is that 
when, when I was young, uh, you didn't have to worry about eating your hostas. Because in, at least where I lived, there just weren't that many of them. Oh. And, uh, I happened to live in, in myself in a spot where there were fields all around me. So if I had had hostas in the yard, yeah, they would have eaten them. But the deer, uh, for the most part, were skittish. But now they'll come right into town. It's so friendly. Yeah, and they'll come in and they're friendly and, and so on. Um, I can remember one time uh, after I had just moved to the, the location of the house that we, uh, we lived in during this time. And it was the very next morning after we moved in. We lived out in the middle of a field. And when I looked out in the morning, there was a whole herd of deer grazing on my front yard. That was like shocking because, uh, you know, that, that would happen today, but never would have happened back then. Right. So the moment, you know, we opened the door, you know, they were gone, you know. Right. Uh, I felt very fortunate because where I lived, there was a, a herd of deer, you know, which right. you didn't find very often. And I remember, uh, you know, I just keep rambling, but I remember reading a book one time. In fact, I still have the book. And it was uh, about a person who went hiking all along the Hudson River in what they call highlands. That's where I grew up, along the highlands. And they, while he was hiking in one of his stories, he saw three deer. And he says that was very unusual that you would see any deer at all. And this was mm -hmm. in the 20s. And then, of course, after, uh, after the Depression, deer hunting was very, very heavy. And, uh, and that was, I think, a good portion of the good reason that the, the deer were no longer around. You know, people just were looking for food. Uh, but I, one, one of the things I wanted to do, I, I was wondering if one of my grandchildren were there. Lila, are you there? She's muted. Oh, she's muted. Can we un yeah. can, can we unmute Lila? Asked her to make a thing. Where is she? Come on, beautiful goddess Lila. <laughs> <laughs> or, or maybe Hannah or, or Jakey. Uh, they're on a different one. Yeah, where's Hannah? They were here. <laughs> okay. Uh. <laughs> I don't know how they do that. I, I, Lila's yeah, they by went, herself. They went running to the... practice one thing or another. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. They will. We want yeah. on, on the, uh, put your video on, please. There we go. Uh, I just unmuted her. <laughs> on, uh, Lila? Yeah. Uh, Lila, can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, hi, honey. Hi. I, I, was, I wanted to talk to you for a minute. Okay. Okay. Because I've only got. Can, can you uh, can you can tell, tell me uh, tell me what your favorite part of the story is? You were telling me the other day you 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 liked about the acorns, right? Yeah. Yeah. What did what did you like about the acorn? Video here of the beautiful. That is like candy. That's like candy. Yeah. And the other thing you told me was something about the birds. What was about the birds? Oh, maybe that was Livy. Is Livy there too? Yeah. Yeah. Wait, where did you like the birds? Where's Melinda? Yeah. Hey, we have some video. I'm trying to get. I'm trying to get my granddaughter. Melinda has to do it. Melinda has to do it. Melinda's not there. Lila's running it for uh, Oh, Lila? Okay, on the bottom, yeah. you know, on the bottom of your screen, you get to put a thing that says, uh, that's a video. Just click on it and we can see your beautiful face. Could you do that? What? This is video. <laughs> anyway, answer your grumpies. That's all right. All right, Will, going on to Will's children. What? They're gone. They're, they're, they're gone. They, they've gone off to stuff. Anyway, <laughs> any other thoughts or questions from people that are not part of the family? <laughs> <laughs> Wait, 
Wait, Lila's coming back. Lila's. Lila, oh. where are you? Are you there? Yeah. Okay, so we don't see your video, but you had maybe something you wanted to tell us about your grandpa's story. We That's would what... love to hear okay. it. That's what I was going to ask. I was going to ask, um, what do you think about your grandpa's stories? And and uh, and has he told them to you often? Lila, you're up. Lila, Lila honey, can you hear me? Lila. Are you answering the question? Oh, yeah. Oh, did. Yeah. Oh, okay. Just, uh, they, Carolyn, Carolyn was asking you a question. Why, oh, why, why don't you, can you answer it? Did yeah. You? Yeah. Okay. Well, I was interested in what, what you found interesting about your grandpa's stories, because he's written, this is the third one now, right? Second one. Second one. But, um, no, what? What intrigues you about, like, what feels the same or different from you as a little girl growing up in America today? Um, um, That's okay, honey. You know, you know, you, you, I, I know you don't want to say. Lila has... Uh, a, a copy of all my stories, as does, as does Hannah, and how, as and so does the uh, Jakey and Libby. Okay, Diana has a question. Okay, good. Bill, can you tell us about the illustrator? Ah, good question. Um, yeah, um, Misty uh, Misty Falzano Hobbs is her name. When I first met her, she was a neighbor in Asbury Grove, where we both had cottages. Uh, I was looking for an illustrator, and uh, she had just moved in, and I saw her out in the yard, and she was painting. And so it occurred to me that she might be, be willing to illustrate my stories, and in fact, she did. So uh, She did that for my first book, and then I asked her if she would do it for the second one, which she did. And uh, I am, of course, am, am very pleased with, with her work. She doesn't live in Massachusetts anymore. She now lives in Kansas, in Wichita, Kansas. Uh, but, uh, you know, in this day and age, you can have an illustrator you know, who, who could be anywhere, and you can communicate with them. And as we do these illustrations, uh, we work on them together. Uh, she reads the story. Of course, I know the story. And then we talk about what illustrations might be uh, appropriate. And then we kind of finalize, you know, whatever number we want. In this case, I think about eight, about 10 maybe. And then uh, uh, we sort of talk about approximately what they would look like. And then she goes ahead and does the illustrations. And what I find wonderful about it is that she often goes off on tangents. Uh, mm -hmm. We didn't discuss, and they they tend to be really kind of uh, really really nice, and they they enhance the story a lot. Uh, for example, in this story, we did not talk about an illustration of the Hudson River, the map of the Hudson River. But when I saw it, I said, "Oh, that's wonderful! It fits right in." Uh, and so, you know, it, it, it's it's nice to have it's nice to have uh, people look at it from different angles. And my wife was just mentioning that uh, this was another one. Uh, I didn't know how she was going to handle that, but you know, with those birds with their mouths open, you can see they're chatty birds. <laughs> so it was kind of, at least kind of a cute uh, touch to it, and she's and she's good at that. So. Thank you. I have yep. a question too. Yeah. Um, how do you think things have changed there in, in, since the 50s in, in the area that you've grown up? Well, that's a, that's a nice question. Uh, I, I love answering questions like that. <laughs> 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 um, I have to say this, I have to tell you that, say that in two parts. Uh, one part is the, the place where I grew up 
and where you saw those photos of hasn't really changed much at all other than extra growth uh, and falling down some walls. However, uh, after saying that, the surroundings around that area have changed dramatically. And the reason that hasn't changed in that one locale is that along on the, th that was a family farm and that family farm is still exists today and it's still in the family. And so that's why it hasn't changed. There's been no selling off of land or any of that. Mm. And uh, that's on basically the right, the, the one side of where I grew up and around the back, of course, where, because this was behind my house. And then on the other side, there is another family farm, but that's, and it's still, it's still kind of a family farm, but it's, it's changed dramatically. As for, you know, the town itself and the, the area around, uh, like every place, there's been a lot, great deal of building and a lot more houses. And in fact, uh, in that photograph in the beginning, where you see the fields where, it, where I say it hasn't changed much. If you were to look closely behind the tree line, you would see there were houses in there. And when I was growing up, of course, there were no houses. It was just, it was all, it was all woods. Uh, and I might say that they're pretty nice houses, <laughs> big McMansions, so to speak, uh, that were in that area, because it was a beautiful area. Uh, the town itself, of course, has changed somewhat, but uh, you know, like everywhere else, it's it's just been built upon. Uh, I wrote a story recently, which I hope to publish someday, and maybe not in too near near distant future. And I call it uh, uh, Main Street: uh, Memories of Main Street. Mm -hmm did was I took, a, in this story, what I've done is I've taken each of the uh, businesses that I remember in the 1950s, and there are 40 of them, and I talk about each one and my experiences as a child in those, in those businesses, with those businesses, and uh, I, I, I'm, I'm, this is one of my favorite ones because I, uh, I think it's, uh, it's kind of a unique picture into 1950s. So I don't know, that's a long answer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Diana has a question. Diana? Um, this is actually a question for Annie. Um, uh, uh, will we be able to purchase autographed uh, copies from your bookstore? Uh, Bill, that's a good question. Would, would you? Yeah, absolutely. And in fact, uh, uh, Patty, has some autographed copies right there now. Oh, I would I would like to have uh, two of each, one for my cottage and one for my home. So uh, I'll contact that. you all later for that. Okay, sure. Just call us. Give us a call. Yeah, and uh, I can put up the uh, the phone number um, after we after we finish. Okay, great. Okay. Thank uh, you. Some of you that don't know, uh, Diana lives in, in San Francisco. Uh, ah, great. Great. So, so I think that that's probably going to be about it. It's, what time is it? It's about, it's, about three o'clock. Probably about three. Oh, almost. What? Almost. 2.56? Yep. Ah. <laughs> so it's about time. So anyway, I want to thank you, Bill. Uh, this was really great. I really enjoyed this. And, well, that's uh, great. And thank you, Selena, for all your, not all your help and also allowing me to do this. Oh, it was great. Thank you to and, Annie's bookstore. Thank you. Yeah. I'm in Brooklyn, New York, and I want to say that we have a big movement to support local bookshops. So mm -hmm. uh, please give me the that room and I've got a lot of people I didn't this snuck up on me I got a lot of deer hunting friends who have maybe children or grandchildren and I, I, I'm gonna rally up some bookstore support for this and that's also, great that's good and I just want to say to everyone who's on today I, I, I really appreciate you coming on and, and taking the time to listen to the 
to uh, the discussion and the, the reading of the story. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Thank wonderful. you, Bill. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. I'm Thank you, okay. Selena. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you. Thank nice. you, Laura. Thank, Thank you, Laura. You. Bye. <laughs> Thanks for coming, everybody. Hey. Let's keep on going. Here's okay. the here's the information. Excellent. Great, thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 <laughs> Okay, so it looks like it's just us. Mm -hmm. It does, so you can log out, I guess, if you want. Okay, so does that mean I just go up and I hit leave? Hang on, uh, let me stop sharing and... Okay, I'm gonna end it. Okay. Yep. Okay? All right, sounds good. End, end meeting for all. Okay.